Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Halftime Talk. I'm honored to be joined by Maliha Bengali, founder of MB Commodity Corner. Good afternoon, Maliha. Good afternoon. Thank you, Shaw, for having me on the show. Pleasure. A pleasure to have you. Uh, Maliha, the commodity markets, the oil and energy markets is within that sitting at the you know, deep into the third, or sorry, the second quarter, deep into April. Uh, and we're starting to have all the signs and the noise of coming out of the COVID pandemic, at least when it comes to the developed markets and the largest economies in the world, the US and Asia. How do you currently assess this, this sort of cycle, if you like, and the, the COVID pandemic cycle, the unique cycle all of its own, uh, and coming out of it, are we indeed coming out of it? And how do you see that? Okay, it's interesting. I mean, the world has really changed in one year. I think towards the second half of the year, the main thing that changed for the markets commodity specifically is this um, story of liquidity. You know, you've heard the words going from deflation to reflation, especially inflation. The biggest topic in our industry is are we in fact in time due for inflationary cycle or is it just a short term blip? So commodities, the way, the way commodities work is you have to look at the macro cycle, which was very supportive. There's central bank liquidity in excess of $30 trillion. It's supporting all hard assets, inflationary. You have a very- Would you consider that a macro cycle seeing as it's very much an emergency stimulus or should we bake it in the cake as normal now? It's well, if you look at the last 10 years from the Lehman crisis for the last 10 to 12 years, the central banks have not reduced their balance sheet. So we keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, going back to 2018, we never normalized. So my, my theory is that's too big to fail. And eventually we can talk about that later on, we might have another problem where they need to pump more money in the system. Having said that, the fact that liquidity has been so ample and COVID obviously has stimulated a massive response. I don't think the central banks have the luxury or the privilege to take it back down as it'll derail the recovery. So that macro backdrop has been very supportive for the five to 10 years, especially in the last two and a half years, pre-COVID and post-COVID. Now, what we do on the commodity side is once you have a macro backdrop, we look at the micro story. Now we break down oil and gas or copper or aluminum. The stories there have also been very supportive for getting just the demand supply fundamentals. So into Q4 and Q1 in the second half of the first half of this year, we have been very supportive of, uh, of, of copper prices, we are very bullish in gold and silver. Energy, we've been selectively bullish because it's a seasonal timing game. But there is no shortage of, of, of oil. We've always had this view where the market can go from periods of deficit to surplus, and you have to time that cycle. So we are a lot more selective. We are not commodity super cycle bulls, but we are very proactively bullish on select commodities. It is, it is a timing game. But I think the demand response is, is very bullish. You know, we are emerging from a massive uh, recessionary environment. You can see the as China is now entering a bit of a peak period, they're slowing down. The developed markets from the year year base effects are actually still doing really, really well. So we probably have another three months of this amazing backdrop. And then the second half of this year is a bit debatable in our opinion. Well, if we look at just some of those themes you picked up on coming out of the COVID pandemic, uh, inevitably inflation has been probably one of the bigger uh, alarm bells that have been ringing, particularly in the US, uh, but also seems to be some concerns in China. But I wonder if this isn't a deflation issue going forward. I mean, we've pumped all of this stimulus as you articulated, and still, you know, oil has barely got a heartbeat. Commodities, of course, are, are, are elevated at the moment. But ultimately, if we've seen this stimulus-led economic strategy out of Japan for 20 years, and they've barely managed to get deflation out of their rearview mirror. That's a really good question. Okay, so my school of thought is as follows. The past cycles, we've done a lot of monetary stimulation and you know the Fed has done what they've done, but this time it has been accompanied by fiscal stimulus. You've seen a massive you know, $1.9 trillion bill, this talk of more infrastructure spending. So governments this time are doing more than just monetary accommodation. And we've not seen what monetary plus fiscal can do to the inflation cycle. Taking a step back, I'm not saying that we're in a massive hyperinflation environment, but if you look at prices from like lumber, food, soya, or like pure consumer goods or hard assets, there's genuine inflation in the market, probably closer to probably two and a half to three percent. The Fed's measure of inflation is a bit distorted. So they're looking at a very underestimated version. Now, what is causing this inflation? We know it's liquidity. We know it's demand. Economies are massively ramping up. And China did a great job in ramping up a 
aggressively last year to get their GDP back to growth. They're not going to be averaging probably 10% this year, and you know their average target is 5.5%. So the question really is, is this a short-term phenomena? For the next three or four months, energy, for instance, no matter how much money you pump in the system, there is no shortage of oil. We have supply sitting at 8 million barrels per day on the sidelines. OPEC has been very smart about taking that oil off the market to get higher prices. We can argue that they've taken oil out for too long. We have more Iranian oil coming to the market. U.S. Shield has been resilient. So you can argue that even in the best of times, oil never really could make it above 80 dollars. Can we not say the same about every market? Clearly, it's true about oil. Eight, nine million barrels of idle supply being very uh, strictly managed and, and to a great extent impressively so. But the equity markets equally uh, are being pumped up by a, 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 the opposite of, of, of an idle supply, an excess supply of, of liquidity and the printing of money. Uh, and they are also sitting, and in both cases, coming out of this COVID forest, and how do you navigate? How does the Fed navigate down, you know, turning off the taps, the fiscal stimulus, uh, how do the, 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 governments, if you like, particularly in developed economies that are paying the salaries of, of ghost companies and ghost employees, et cetera, et cetera. So the navigation out of these current postures, what is your view on that and how quickly or slowly or what are the challenges of that? So the Fed's taking a big gamble right now. To be to summarize, they honestly do not know and they're really hoping for the best. So their theory is that we have a lot of debt we, the only way to pay this debt down, our next generations will never pay this debt down. They have to deflate the debt away, and that is their theory. They're hoping to provide enough monetary accommodation support to the market rallies and get enough GDP growth, and that will entail them to raise rates eventually. But this is a sort of very precarious scenario because if we get the inflation, but we don't get the GDP growth that's sustainable, they'll be in catch 22. They will lobby to raise rates and they'll have inflation. We've seen this in Turkey, Brazil, and Russia, emerging markets. They are now being forced to raise rates, even though. They, they would rather be providing more stimulus. So the Fed's hoping, so in the next three months, we will get that trigger. But I can tell you one thing for sure. The minute they talk about reducing their balance sheet or even stop the $120 billion a month QE that they're doing, this market is overcooked, 100%. The liquidity has been I and mean, continue to be one of the biggest drivers of this market. That's from a very broad perspective. And we saw what happened in Q4 2018 when the Fed even intimidated that they're going to be taking money out of the market, the markets collapse. So that is a big risk. For now, is, is Bitcoin a, a hedge against that inevitable outcome or is it part of that inflated optimism? It's yes and no. So I think it's part of the, uh, the liquidities that are helping Bitcoin. I think where central banks have to keep printing more and more money, which I think right now, if you see another collapse second half of this year, they will print more money. That's what's going to be pushing gold, Bitcoin, and silver higher, the fiat currency debasement argument. So that's a little bit independent from what the Fed can or cannot do. And eventually, they'll have to be raising more money because they, the, the system is so extended that unless they reset it, which they're too scared to do, Bitcoin and gold and silver keep going higher. And that's our view. So you can't compare goal against Bitcoin. We look at Bitcoin from a pure demand supply. It has a halving cycle and people are obviously institutions getting involved with the money market. People are actually a lot more institution based than retail based, but that's nothing to do with it. Yes, if we get liquidity coming out of the system, Bitcoin will have a correction, but I think it'll be better supporting some of the equities for sure. Is, is, is what is, I mean, without getting down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, uh, trying to understand its correlation between gold uh dollar and then ultimately commodities is it a commodity is it a, an emerging currency how do you assess it just purely within its relativity to the other established assets we treated a bit of a 50 50 percent mix between a currency and a commodity the commodity cycle is helping right now because of its own demand supply and i won't get into the details of the hash rate power and mining but then also as a currency, because you have the fiat currency debasement theory that's taking Bitcoin higher. It is an alternative asset vehicle. If you think the dollar across the border, currencies across the border are getting debased as governments print more and more money to pay down the debt, to pay the debt away, we think obviously these hard assets will do really well. Uh, that's our view. Now, I do not think gold is replacing the uh, Bitcoin or vice versa. They are two separate vehicles. And gold has a very different use and store of value. We like both. It's about the risk management. How do you manage a half a billion in Bitcoin versus a half a billion in gold? That's what's going to be distinguishing your fact. So we don't choose one or the other. 
there's a, a thesis to be invested in Bitcoin and gold, but for instance, gold and silver has a different backdrop altogether, like an industrial use and macro use. So we like all three. It's just a matter of sizing your bet. The, the, the optimism that we've seen in, in Bitcoin, the, the sort of risk on appetite that clearly is underpinning that, uh, there's a certain school of thought that that is a, a reference for continued upward trend in both oil markets because economic growth is on the up. Uh, and so you look to Bitcoin now as some kind of optimism radar, a, a risk on appetite radar. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? I, I don't see it as a risk on risk off thing at all. I see it more as a function of real yields, of bond yields and liquidity. And I think if you take a look at your nominal yields, we know the Fed's going to be capping gross yields at some point. They have the yield curve controlled, as you may have heard. Inflation is picking up, so real yields are flat to down. And that's a very supportive environment for gold, silver, and Bitcoin. For us, that is the most important thing, the money printing, the fiat currency debasement, and real yields. If you're in an environment where inflation does not have again the deflationary environment, plus the Fed reduces the liquidity, a Bitcoin will fall, of course. It might not fall as hard because we have a one-year halving cycle, but that is a big threat. So that's how we view Bitcoin, sort of like an entity subsidiary of the gold real yield component. If we look at oil, uh, just sort of carve it out from all of this and, and, and take its journey of the last year, obviously from debt doorstep a year ago, negative 40 on the WTI uh, and the very managed uh, recovery by OPEC plus Saudi and Russia over the last 12 months, got it to where it now sits in the, in the mid to high 60s. It all sits on, as you say, there's no shortage of supply. How does that look to you going forward at these price levels? Can OPEC continue this stellar performance in managing oil supply, or is that ultimately its main risk? Okay, I think OPEC are doing a very good job, and they're also very lucky. Let's go back a step. So the oil market is driven by two markets, the winter heating oil market, which is just the demand, and the summer market, which is gasoline. So what happens between December and March, we had a very cold winter, that's a Texas freeze that sort of aided the fact that Saudi took off more oil of the market. So they got lucky, but the timing was fantastically good because they tightened it too much. We are now in a shorter period, as you've seen from my many reports and tweets, that between April and May, the market goes down, which is why demand's very soggy and China Asian refining maintenance is happening, which is why demand's falling. So, and now supply be increasing in May, June, July. The question really is what happens in June? The U.S. is now coming out of like the vaccinated world. They're driving more miles. Gasoline demand's picking up. The summer driving season tends to be very strong for the oil markets. And obviously, you have domestic demand in the UAE and the Middle East. So that can actually help keep the market supported. In fact, oil prices will probably grind higher in May onwards after, because of the summer period. But the second half of this year is a problem. So we get these cycles of improvement where demand is more than supply. And obviously, OPEC is timing the supply increase to match that demand. The one caveat is if back in July, if economy is going to uh, like they go into lockdown again, or there's a, another strain or mutant, it's game over. Oil prices will fall back down. So you have to monitor Chinese demand, uh, U.S. demand, driving miles to see what that oil. So oil is better, basically a call on timing. It's not a super cycle, but if you get the timing right, you can do really well. But I wouldn't call it a secular long. Secular long. O OPEC have uh, signaled over the last uh, day or two that they may abandon their plan to have a yet another meeting at the end of April. Uh, your thoughts on that, this constant management, micromanaging of the market, not having a meeting next week, what signals that would send? I think it's exactly what they've been saying. They've talked about how they want to release 350,000 barrels per day in May, June, and July, 400,000 barrels per day. So I think they're just waiting for the demand pickup, buying themselves time, and they want to release that oil just as demand picks up. Uh, and I think that is the, so I would not take it negatively because we know that if there is a shortfall, they might take oil out of the market. But I think they will do whatever they can in their power, and they actually have the power to be the swing producer to keep prices supported. Well, that because stick that OPE or that Saudi has, the sort of uh, one million barrel a day cut uh, uh, that is uh, solo to Saudi Arabia, that kind of stands outside that they can basically use and execute at any moment. That's absolutely true. If they release that one million barrels per day right now, the market will drop by five to seven dollars per barrel easily, and they're using that very wisely. Having said that, obviously. If they release, if they hold the market off, if they take that oil of the market right now, they need higher prices. Their budgets are probably close to eighty-five to ninety dollars, so it suits them to have that. It's quite contentious because the U.S. consumer cannot take a higher oil price with low wage income growth and higher inflation, so it is a bit contentious. But as far as OPEC and Saudi is concerned, they do need higher prices, and they need between sixty and seventy easily. Russia is very happy producing at these levels. It's break even positive. U.S. shale is actually going to be coming back. And that's another debate in the market in our industry is how resilient is U.S. shale? 
Osteo well, how resilient is it? I mean, it, it seems that uh, it has surprisingly not come back in any noticeable amounts, given that we have been, you know, north of 60 or around that for, you know, quite a number of months now. All right. So there's a six month timeline. You take a look at the U.S. Baker Riggs uh, recount. Uh, they started picking up from November, December last year. So it, there's a six month timeline between when the rigs pick up and when production actually hits the tape. So sometime between May and June, we should start seeing more U.S. shale and more U.S. production. So we are more uh, proactive on U.S. production. Also, the, the memory of the market is very short term. I mean, you have amazing financial ease conditions. Banks will probably start lending again. It will not be as aggressive the past few cycles because people have learned from their mistakes. But we will think that this is going to make, I mean, $60 oil, $70 oil Brent is fantastic for anyone to produce. And credit is going to be picking up and have, making sure that they pump more. So we are positive on U.S. shale. Yes, some companies... I mean, there, are, is, there is a narrative emerging, oh, shale on this cycle is now in the hands of the bigger players. In previous cycles, it was the smaller players. Yeah. So there was a lot of sort of growth aspiration without return. Now the bigger players are hesitant because they're looking at obviously the 8 million barrels of idle supply from OPEC, but also the the the, the risk appetite is different on the bigger players. Do you think see that impacting the return of US production over the next 12, 24 months? Absolutely. You are right. The bigger players are getting more involved. There'll be a lot more capital discipline, shareholder return. That's a big factor. But then again, right now we are 10.9 million barrels per day. We may not go to 13, but we could go to 11 and a half, 12. It's quite possible. And we still have a lot of fragmented small players and private equity ventures, so other investment vehicles. Are within you saying that within this year, 11 to half to 12? No, no, I think we can probably see it go to maybe 11 and a half this year. I think that's very, very reasonable, which is actually a very good uh, forecast because some people are thinking they can fall below 10, which we do not see happening. So we think that US shale would be staying at these levels, if not go higher to level 11 and a half, 11 and a half easily. We have non -supply, we have supply of OPEC coming out of the market, which is about 8 million barrels per day. We have demand. Then if you take a look at the bigger picture of oil, demand will pick up in the summer, and, and, and as I mentioned, but we also have this investment um, from electric vehicles, the, the secular demand decline in oil as well. So we cannot assume a market is as tight. Oil is pretty much in a secular decline, but we have periods of like our performance. So you have to time those art performance, and that has been our thesis on oil. But there's a lot of different factors as well. If you take the point you made earlier on the outlook for U.S. driving season, uh, typically a, a, a normal times, a, a bullish period of the of this cycle. Um, this year, there's a big questions about whether we're going to have summer summer travel aviation. We're going to see the jet fuel come back uh, or not. Uh, I'm wondering from your perspective, if we have, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. government is about to give a travel warning to U.S. travelers for 80 percent of the world, uh, 160 countries on their banned list or their don't go to list. Uh, ultimately, we're looking at a, you know, an Uber staycation summer. Could that compensate on the gasoline side for the loss of jet fuel? Uh, yes and no. I don't think it can. That'll be a massive hit. If the U.S. government announces that, that's about 3.7 million barrels per day of just lit. We're going to be losing. Jet fuel has been a huge lagging indicator. Even though we see a ramp up in gasoline demand, we think we need travel demand to see high oil prices. If you go back two and a half years when the world was back at 100 million barrels per day, oil prices were close to $70 per barrel. So how much more would you need to get in higher prices? We think no. If you do not have travel demand and delayed reopenings, that's going to be leading over the oil market. That is a huge negative. Let's just wrap up with the big geopolitics that also seems to be hanging over the general global recovery, but yet doesn't seem to be as a, you know impacting yet. We've got China-US face-off, which seems to have multiple skirmishes, the Taiwan Straits and the big issues there. We've got Ukraine, the, the face-off there between Russia and the accumulation of the Russian army on the coast there. We have this Iran rapprochement. How do you see the geopolitics playing out in the second half of this year in those different theaters? Uh, in terms of the impact of the oil price or just geopolitics in terms of... Well, energy? I think it, it, it ultimately where it might come down to the markets. I mean, if we have, let's start with Iran rapprochement with the US, they are an OPEC member. They're already leaking a million barrels a day, with, at least according to most secondary sources. Right. So in terms of the impact of the oil market, you're absolutely correct. Iran right now, if we have to lift the sanctions, we can have over 1.4 to 1.6 million barrels per day hit the market. We know China has already been buying oil from Iran through their floating offshore market. And right now, they, that is why the demand on the physical side, on the Western side is a bit lower. So that is a big risk to come to the market too, uh, once these sanctions are lifted. 
On the geopolitical side, we think the biggest risk on all the factors that you mentioned is to do with the dollar. And as you've noticed that China recently launched their central bank digital currency, they claim it's for domestic use only, but their aspirations are for a much more cross-border national purchase is going to the Winter Olympics in a few years from now. I think that is the biggest risk to the dollar, right? Because China has, the, and they are making a very uh, strong point saying that there's nothing to do with the dollar reserve currency status, but these, these tensions are building up at some point, And we've seen that affect the dollar that can take uh, that can affect uh, that can impact commodity markets a lot and that for me is the biggest risk second half of this year how does us handle that how does it play into the fed launching its own central bank digital currency we know they have those aspirations as well and what will that do to bitcoin and just sort of you know helicopter money as you call it we know that central banks want to obviously have that to be able to print more money once again going back to gold and silver which is very very supportive on hard assets so it also ties into that well, Malia, I think we will leave it there. We could certainly talk for longer and I really enjoy the conversation. Malia Bengali, founder of MB Commodity Corner, have a great newsletter, really enjoy reading it. And thank you for spending some time with us on Halftime Talk. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Take care.